Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Concordia University presents the Walrus Talks Vice. My name is Shelley Ambrose. I'm the executive director of the Walrus Foundation and the publisher of the Walrus Magazine. I'd like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on what is most recently the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, a place of conversation for millennia. Hands up if you know what the Walrus Magazine is. Yes. That's so great. Hands up if you subscribe. I'm mad at half of you. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. I'll just, we'll deal with that later. How many people have been to a Walrus Talks? Thank you. And how many are new to the Walrus Talks? Welcome. Those of you who have been here before, welcome the newbies. For those new to us, the Walrus Foundation has an educational mandate to create forums for conversation on matters vital to Canadians. Forums like this, on stages from coast to coast to coast, and also forums that include the Walrus magazine, in print, tablet and phone, and all kinds of daily content on the walrus.ca. So on behalf of our editor-in-chief, Jonathan Kay, and the rest of the Walri, who are here tonight, Thank you for reading the magazine. Thank you for subscribing. A very warm welcome to our subscribers. And thank you for being here tonight. On all Walrus platforms, you'll find stories and conversations about politics, culture, the environment, business, technology, art, cities, the west, the east, the north, foreign affairs, water, energy, youth leadership, and more. Tonight, we tackle the small topic of vice. As Albert Einstein said, as far as I'm concerned, I prefer silent vice to ostentatious virtue. We at the Walrus do not believe in silent vice. We believe in talking about vice, and that's what we're going to do. The Walrus has no wings. We are an independent entity with no owners and no one point of view. We're governed by a national board of directors. Some of them are in the house tonight. Bruce Bennett, Sherry Austin, Martha Durden, Diane Blake, Lucille Joseph. We also have a National Advisory Council whose names you can see on the masthead of our magazine, which when you subscribe comes to your house. <laughs> it comes. When you join us on all Walrus platforms, including here tonight, you know that you have something in common with the Walrus community. It means you are fearless, witty, thoughtful, and you're curious about Canada and its place in the world. We're supported by circulation, advertising, sponsorship, and charitable donations. Every day, I like to acknowledge our founding donor, the Chalkers Foundation. I think Bruce Bennett and Jim O'Reilly from Chalkers are here tonight. Without them, no us. That's all I can say. There's also no way we can do the work that we do without organizations like Concordia, tonight's presenting sponsors. And a very warm welcome to the Concordia alumni here tonight. Where are you? Excellent. Welcome, Concordia. Welcome to the University of Toronto. Um, I have to say that, this beautiful theater. Concordia is dedicated to the Canadian conversation, not just with this series of Walrus Talks. They have their own event series in Montreal. And just before I introduce Alan Shepard, I want to point out the origin of the word vice. The word vice comes from the Latin word vitium, meaning failing or defect. The modern English term that best captures its original meaning is the word vicious, which actually means full of vice. This meaning, however, is completely separate from the word vice when used as an official title to indicate a deputy, substitute, or subordinate, as in vice president, <laughs> viceroy, or vice chancellor. Please welcome Concordia's president and vice chancellor, Alan Shepard. <laughs> Bonsoir tout le monde. Great to be back here at the Isabel Bader Theatre. I got to confess, Shelley, while you were giving your talk and I was standing back there, at one point you said the walrus talks, but what I heard was the walrus sucks. And I thought, well, <laughs> this is a night about vice. I guess we're getting right to it. But there are better ways to get subscribers than dissing your own magazine. So <clears throat> I think it's just uh, the hearing is going. Uh, it's great to be back here. When I immigrated to Canada, I was uh, here a fellow of Victoria College uh, some long time ago now. 
So thanks to all of you for being here tonight. And as Shelly said, a special welcome to Concordia alumni, friends, family, parents who are here with us this evening. My job is simple, just to say to you that Concordia University now has about 46,000 students on two campuses in uh, central Montreal. It started in the 19th century with Loyola College in 1896, started in an apple orchard. And in 1926, Sir George Williams began to educate immigrants, first in their family to go to university, women who'd gotten a divorce, and many other people who were looking for a place. We took people regardless of their creed, their sexual orientation, what color they were, what country they'd come from. And in 1974, Sir George and Loyola uh, had a bit of a shotgun marriage, that's a long story, uh, to become the modern day Concordia, which is a modern research university with a lot of strengths in a lot of areas. Uh, we take seriously the idea of connecting the, the talent we have on campus with the communities that support us. So those of you who are supporting us, and there are many of you who are, we really appreciate all the help. I want to just thank the Walrus team. They're great partners in crime in this initiative as we move across Canada talking to people about ideas. Bon soirée. I did not say that. And in fact, when my kids were little and people started using that awful term, that sucks, it sucks, I, I didn't allow them to say that. They had to say, it didn't rock. So I was really saying the walrus rocks. Thank you, Alan. I want you all to know about an incredible project Concordia has created with the family of a beloved Canadian icon. The Mordecai Richler Reading Room at Concordia is the actual home of the physical objects of Mordecai Richler's uh, writing room. Um, and it's his desk, his typewriter, some of his papers, books and mementos, as well as, of course, an ashtray brimming with the ends of cigars, and a perpetual glass of Macallan. That was a man who enjoyed his vices. Yes. It houses a writer in residence. At present, it is Anne-Marie MacDonald, and she's created an incredible video series, which you can, of course, watch at thewalrus.ca. So thank you, Concordia. These talks would not happen without you. These are the 49th walrus talks across the country since we started them in 2000 and whatever that year was. Um, these talks also wouldn't happen about each, without each of you because if you weren't here, the walrus talkers would have no one to talk to. And we know you're busy, so thank you for your time and for your interest. I also want to mention our national partners at Shirk, Shaw, Inspire, and Amia Aeroplan. Thank God they're with us wherever we go, or we also couldn't get around the way that we do. We're live streaming tonight at thewalrus.ca, and you can watch these talks and 300 other walrus talkers free and on demand without having Netflix at thewalrus.ca on Walrus TV. Now here's how the walrus talks works. Each of our esteemed speakers, there are seven of them, they have exactly seven minutes each. They know this. They will come up and introduce themselves. They will come up all in a row. I will not pop up here and read their bios to you. You each have a program in your hand. It's in speaker order. Flip it over. And if you want to know more about them, please follow along. We keep the lights up for this very purpose. You will see and hear seven speakers in a row. And our hope that is that in an hour, we will meet you in the lobby for a post-talks reception, and we'll all have a lot to talk about there and out there in the world. So just before they start, I want to thank them in advance. Thank you very much, host of Good Morning Toronto on Jazz FM 91, Garvia Bailey, Concordia's Rebecca Duclo, host of CBC's Under the Influence, Terry O'Reilly, Concordia's Nadia Chaudhry, Clinical psychologist and professor right here at U of T, Jordan Peterson. Music and writer, Torquil Campbell. Author and the co-host of Daily Planet, Dan Riskin. Thank you for coming. Let us begin. Got to get my timer. I'm serious. Okay, here we go. 
Hi, my, my name is uh, Garvey Bailey, and I like music a whole lot. I have immersed myself in it in a few ways. I'm an arts journalist, so I go out to see lots of music. I support musicians however I can. I also host the morning show on Jazz FM 91. It's called Vice and All That Jazz. It's not. It's actually not called that at all. My talk today is called And By Their Vice We Are Healed. If that sounds biblical to you, it's because it is. It's taken from Isaiah 53, 5. A less King Jamesy version of what that means goes like this. He was wounded by our rebellious acts. He was crushed for our sins. He was punished so that we could have peace and we received healing from his wounds. The he is good old JC, we know this, giving of himself the ultimate sacrifice, crushed for our sins so that we could have peace through his suffering. It's morbid stuff. It's what I grew up on. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, so it feels a little bit uh, odd to uh, use it in this way, but for me, music has been a huge part of my spiritual growth. So I feel especially drawn to that. I want to tell the stories of musicians. I worry for their well-being. I, I feel fiercely protective of the musicians, even the boorish ones, because in sharing their gift, they are sacrificing something. And that's what led me to this topic today. It's a personal story that I'm gonna tell, a few personal stories. Their vice equals our redemption, equals my redemption. So my relationship with all this started, I was 10 years old, growing up in Stratford, Ontario. I walked into my home, velvet uh, wallpaper, uh, and uh, there was a, a, a Jesus bust on our front hallway. This is, I'm not kidding, this is true. And I walked in for lunch one day. The house was filled with an acrid, heavy smoke, the sweet and oily smell of hash burning and weed, and then teenage sweat, and sweet notes of Bonnie Bell lip balm. Long-haired dudes with uh, jean jackets were walking around the house, and there were some girls with hot pants and low shirts. And it was so loud in that house. The raging guitars and falsetto screams and heavy bass lines, and I stood frozen. And Coppercraft Jesus looked on. And my bigger brother intercepted me. And before I could speak, he handed me $10. <laughs> 10 whole dollars, and he said, shh. Don't tell mom and dad. In the background, Robert Plant sang, got no time, for spreading roots, the time has come to be gone, and to our health we drank a thousand times. It's time to ramble on. What the hell does that mean, my teenage brain? I was like, what? What's a ramble on? And then I felt what it meant, and I felt it through the bottom end. John Bonham doing something to my middle section with his drums, and I had $10. My silence was bought. I was complicit. This was how Vice was introduced to me, through a lens of music. My brother introduced me to the music that day, after everything was cleaned up. It was Rush and Ozzy and Sabbath and Styx and Blondie and Benatar and Queen and Hendrix and Zeppelin. And it was dangerous, all of it. So dangerous, in fact, that John Bonham died after a 12-hour alcohol binge. One of his last conversations with Robert Plant was about feeling like he wasn't enough as a musician. He was never enough as a drummer. He was a talent and a wounded soul. My preaching brain was all in for exploring what it meant to be human and beautiful and flawed, and that's what these musicians were to me. So I took my babysitting money and I gathered up all the information I could by buying Spin and Rolling Stone and all the magazines and getting to know who these people were. So I dug in. Puberty looming, a black girl in a white world with few romantic prospects. Sex, of course, became an obsession. And who took me into that world? Grinding and touching and moaning and washing in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Well, we know who it was. It was Prince. It didn't matter that I'd never had a date or kissed a boy. Hot whispers of darling Nikki. That was enough. Throwing my sex around with Coppercraft Jesus watching wasn't an option. But Prince, he said it was okay. Just do your thing, girl. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. 
Prince, the mini sex machine from uh, Minnesota, was uh, immersed in his own balancing act of the sacred and the profane, vice and virtue hand in hand. And then I got older and I moved to Toronto and a lot of music came at me. It was In Utero and Bad Motor Finger and Alice in Chains and Dirt, The Rise of Grunge. And I realized that in that, there was something that was happening. A necessary evil became a part of the art. I sat back and watched good music being created in a carnival of flannel and heroin. Life is a waste of time and time is a waste of life, so let's all get wasted and have the time of our lives. And that was Kurt Cobain. There was no pause to say maybe, just maybe there's something wrong with our relationship, my relationship to these doomed souls, people that were getting beaten up and spit out. Michael Jackson came, he spiraled, so entertaining, sexual confusion, perhaps perversion, a need to be loved by us, and he spiraled, and he medicated with pain, with, medicated away the pain, and we watched, and he danced, and then he died. And then Amy Winehouse, a tiny bird with a giant voice who only wanted to sing. We didn't let up on Amy. She sang her heart, and then her heart burst. Bulimia and booze and drugs and heartbreak. Her last words to her handler 24 hours before she died, if I could, I would take it all back so that I could just sing again. In her final days, sick and confused, she was booed from the stage by hundreds and thousands of people. She was the butt of late night jokes, fodder and entertainment. She had given us every single thing we needed to get over our own heartbreak, but we couldn't give her what she needed to get over hers. So vice, what is it? A habit that spoils one's chances of achieving happiness, as one def definition put it. Music could and should be the source of happiness. 12 notes of a rich, happy place, but those who wield those notes are exposing themselves, raw and vulner vulnerable. What they do for us is crucial. I am here unscathed because Mingus and Simone and Winehouse and Cobain and MJ and Jaco Pistorius and Hendrix, well, they did it. And I failed to let them know through their pain we were and continue to be healed. I don't know, maybe we could have saved them. Thank you. Bonsoir, hello. I'm Rebecca Duclos. And this is my father in a photograph from the late 1960s when he was in Pirandello's Six Characters in Search of an Author. As an actor, he had humble beginnings but high aspirations. Pretty close, I think. <laughs> so Albert Joseph Duclos, Jr., son of Albert Sr., a baker in Westbrook, Maine, first-generation Franco-American, made it through high school, acted his first Shakespeare, age 17, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Brattle Theater. A few years on, he scrapped it out in sta on stage and screen in New York City, late life BA and MA, and soon thereafter, assistant professor of theater, much to his surprise. Also, late life husband and father. Exquisite writer, beautiful speaker, mystical Catholic, closeted bisexual. Guiding light, dead for almost a decade. He keeps in touch, as does my late mother, through a series of delicious and decadent discoveries, one of which I'd like to share with you tonight. Welcome to the world. Welcome to the world of Ramshead Passage and Battery Foot, my father's two gay porn novels from the late 1970s. <laughs> Let me read to you from one of the many drafts of Ram <laughs> Ramshead Passage. He thinks of himself as twice his normal size, standing astride the pool above Charles, ejaculating on his supine figure. Erotically heightened by the image of himself over Charles, he unconsciously loosens his pants and, and lowers his skivvies. While intently looking at Charles, he slowly begins to masturbate. Near the moment of his ejaculation, the sun suddenly casts polarized rays on the water surrounding Charles, which causes a blinding, numinous reflection, which obscures Charles's figure from Harris's vision. 
The intensity of the glaring surface disconnects and destroys the fantasy image for Harris. What remains to be completed is the compulsion commanding Harris's body. Distracted, he completes his masturbation, the ashen sediment of his furtive desires. <laughs> Falling back into exhaustion, we know, and Harris senses, that the numinous mirror of the tidal pool not only hid Charles, it rejected the image that Harris sought to capture of himself. I don't need to tell you that there are a few problems with the text. <laughs> I'll let Arabelle J. Porter do that. <laughs> Dear Mr. Duclos, I'm sorry the various readings of your novel Battery Foot have not been as favorable as I should have hoped. It goes just a bit further toward pornography, I fear, than suits our taste. There's some good writing in the book and good characterization, but I fear it is not a book we can publish with the necessary fanfare. <laughs> Let's stay with that necessary fanfare for a moment. Is fanfare really what my father wanted? Sure, on the one hand, they wanted bucks, big bucks, and fame. But who's they? I forgot to tell you, my father had a collaborator. That would be my Uncle Herb, my godfather. <laughs> a well-known translator and much lauded scholar of Islamic studies. And a practicing Catholic. This was their secret project, and it went on for years. Herb is still alive, and he doesn't know I'm speaking to you tonight. <laughs> so I won't say much more, except to quote him. Here's his reading of the project from June 28, 1972. Dear Al, your correspondence is outrunning my capacity in a sort of premature literary ejaculation. <laughs> Keep some for consultation. Are you making separate notes? We have to be careful not to weave in or impose too much on the basic text and to keep a single, even style. Harness your Shakespeareanism, old chum, for we're aiming at monetary, not literary success, remember? <laughs> so here we are in 1976 on the small summer island where I would later find out the novels were set. <laughs> Me on the left, dad in the middle, my sister Catherine, and our dog Mandy. Almost 30 years later, after my father died, my sister and I found folders and folders of typed manuscript, manuscripts, reams of handwritten notes, film treatments, research material, correspondence between Herb and Al, numerous rejection letters from publishers, you name it, it was all there. If the quantity of my father's proto-novelistic output is any indication, he had a very healthy, <clears throat> procreative relationship to the written word. Albert had many lives, I now understand. His life of literary vice was a private preoccupation that was completely unknown to me growing up, as was his radical Catholicism. He was lobbying for women in the church and gay priests in the 1980s. Now I know why, but I didn't always know, and neither did my sister. But we think my mother must have, for her own reasons, and that's another walrus talk. She thought dad's orientation suited her just fine. In what might be, I suppose, a fittingly literary way, my father eventually chose to disclose his past to us by placing a bookmark, bookmark in Richard Gilman's 1986 Catholic conversion memoir, Faith, Sex, Mystery. You theater types will know Richard as the New York literary editor and drama critic, Yale prof, and Penn president. On page 186, he writes, for some months I shared an apartment on York Avenue with a young man, Albert, for whom, whom I'd met through the bookstore. He was a kind, gentle fellow, extremely pious. He later became a monk. That's not exactly true. And supportive of my struggle to acclimatize myself in the faith. His piety had a somewhat desperate edge to it, I realize now, for it was what kept his homosexuality, which I knew about, but kept putting out of my mind from turning into physical acts. So leave it to another to tell you about the man you love. Sometimes it just has to be that way. But I'm grateful to Richard for that, and to Uncle Herb and Arabelle J. Porter. And I'm also grateful to Charles and Harris and Amy and Robert and Whiteley and Rushing and Foote and the dozen other characters in Dad's two secret porn novels, because they were all part of him, part of his other self, a self that was able to write his own kind of drama well away from the rest of us. 
Thank you for being part of my decadent discovery and for giving Albert some time in the limelight. Fanfare, maybe not, but necessary, absolutely. Good night. Wow. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Terry O'Reilly. Thank you. Lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, envy, pride, wrath. The seven deadly sins or an advertising brief for Molson Canadian. It's hard to tell. Branding Vice has a long history in my industry. I give you Don Draper. As he lit a lucky strike, he was pouring three fingers of bourbon over ice as he seduced his client's wife, all the while dreaming up some zippy new copy for a beer in his head. Yes, Donald was a multitasker. But the love of Vice goes back much further than the madmen of the 60s. Many of the mightiest advertising agencies that started in the early 20th century, the ones that still stand today, like Young and Rubicam and BBDO, were all founded by the sons of preachers, which I find most interesting. While those young men watched their fathers rail against the deadly sins with fire and brimstone, and saw a repentant congregation come back week after week for forgiveness, those boys saw a future in vice and built monolithic corporations. See, advertising stumbled onto its greatest insight back then. And the insight was this. Everybody is really two people. The person you are and the person you want to be. All marketing is squarely aimed at person number two. You want to be sexy. You want to eat in the finest restaurants. You want to be a highly paid individual. You want to vacation in, in exotic locales. You want your neighbors to admire your car. You want to show off your house. You want to let off a little steam on the golf course. That is code for lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, envy, pride, and wrath. Maybe you're thinking there was more vice advertised back in the bourbon-soaked skin, cha uh, skirt chasing rather, Mad Men days. I say no. With the exception of tobacco, there is way more vice marketed today. There are now hundreds of beer brands. The liquor category is overflowing. The casino advertising is big business. There are plastic surgery ads. There is a 24-hour channel dedicated to home shopping. The Victoria's Secret Fashion Show is now a major network broadcast event. And then, of course, there's Ashley Madison. <laughs> when I was a young green copywriter, I saw firsthand how unstoppable Vice was. I had written a TV commercial for Labatt. The script had three guys sitting around talking about beer. It was clever, I thought, and funny. And the client read it and said, where's the girls? And I said, well, there are no girls in this commercial. And he said, it'll never fly. And I said, well, wait, 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 wait. I said, beer drinkers are smart. They like to laugh, and they don't need girls in every single commercial. So he just stared at me and said, fine. We'll bring your commercial into a focus group and test it against another commercial we already have. And I said, great. There were 12 male beer drinkers in the focus group that night. My commercial was shown to them. There were a few half smiles. Then the other commercial was shown, which I seem to recall featured the Swedish bikini team. And in a show of hands, the men were asked to vote for their favorite commercial, and 12 hands shot up for the bikini team, which proved to me that you can't fight vice. But I'm going to make a confession right here and right now. Truth be told, Advertising vice is fun. I'm sorry, it just is. 
I won't be surprised if at least one of my esteemed fellow speakers stands up here tonight and points to marketing as the root of all evil, the source of all viceness. And I'll sit down there in the penalty box. But I have to tell you something. Branding vice is wickedly delicious. Because look, I spent 20 years working on Goodyear tires, trying to come up with interesting ways to make you fall in love with vulcanized rubber. <laughs> it's not easy. I had hair when I started in this business. My job as an advertising copywriter was to infuse emotion into products, like tires and toothpaste and deodorants and, and cheese. And it was difficult, it was vexing. But with beer and liquor and casinos, we had the opposite problem. The naughtiness overfloweth. We had to just pump the brakes on that, right? In tire advertising, you're trying to attract attention with tread patterns and rain-displacing technology. But with beer, you just need to show a guy in a bar ordering a certain brand, and an attractive girl notices him. Done. <laughs> with toothpaste, you have to find ways to animate, animate rather, gingivitis. But when you're advertising hedonistic adult vacation spots, you're shooting on a beach in Bali. When you're advertising deodorant, you're photographing underarms. When you're advertising a casino, you're filming slot machines and spilling, spinning roulette wheels and this cast from Cirque du Soleil in slow motion. And when you're advertising cheese, you're advertising cheese. I think you know where I'm going with this. It's so much more fun to advertise a vice. Plus, branding a vice is so easy because you're dealing with just three ingredients. Temptation, seduction, and a little dollop of shame. Now, tempting with a vice is easy. Seduction, voluntary. And shame is the parenthetical unsaid part. It's the element. See, a vice isn't a vice until you have mixed feelings about it. It tempts you, seduces you, and leaves you with a couple of small red marks. And that's why it's so much fun to advertise. It's the same reason why actors love to play villains. They get to tiptoe onto the dark side. As a matter of fact, over the past 20 years, 11 actors have won Oscars for playing evil villains. Clearly, mustache twirling is profitable. There's even a vice fund you can invest in. It consists of tobacco, alcohol, and defense industries. OK, when it comes to vices, that's a touchdown, an end zone dance, and a ball spike all in one. Which brings me full circle to the founding fathers of the modern advertising industry. Those preacher sons understood the undertow of human nature. Without vice, there is no virtue. Without virtue, you can't define vice. It's the circle of life, Simba. <laughs> and if you don't agree with me, we can talk about it right after this event. Meet you at the bar. When I was 17, I traded Karachi, the city of my birth, for a quiet town in Pennsylvania called Lancaster. Lancaster was home to Franklin and Marshall College, an American institute of higher education that had offered me a full scholarship. But the scholarship only covered tuition and board, and I desperately needed a job. The cafeteria came to my rescue. I fried endless slabs of bacon, restocked the salad bar, hefted trays of pie from the kitchen to the dessert line. One evening, I escaped to the loading dock behind the cafeteria for a break. A coworker was already there smoking a cigarette. He offered me one, and after a minute's hesitation, I took it. My first cigarette. The buzz was immediate. 
I became dizzy and had to sit down. I felt nauseous but giddy. I smoked the entire thing. And after that, I joined my coworker every evening on the loading dock for a cigarette. But I didn't think of myself as a smoker. It was just one cigarette, and I never bought them myself. <laughs> but then one day I did buy them, and I kept buying them for the next 12 years. I loved smoking. It was my vice. It was something I savored even as I felt my lungs blacken. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia Chaudhry. I'm a neuroscientist and associate professor of psychology at Concordia. And today I'd like to explore the hypothesis that we are all hardwired for vice, that our psychological and biological infrastructure is superbly designed to make it easy for us to succumb to those wicked but oh so pleasurable addictions. So the term Pavlovian conditioning probably rings a bell. In Pavlov's experiments, a bell was paired with food, which produces saliva for digestion. Pavlov's dogs salivated when they heard the bell because they had formed an association between the bell and the food. Human beings are teeming with similar classically conditioned reflexes. The smell of coffee that incites the caffeine junkie to rush out and buy an espresso. The sound of a car backfiring that causes the war veteran to duck for cover. Through classical conditioning, we can link salient events with environmental stimuli that precede or accompany those events, and this fundamental learning process allows us to react to cues that predict good or bad things. So how does all this relate to addiction? Well, imagine for a moment someone drinking alcohol. Create a rich mental image. Hear the clink of ice tumbling into the highball glass. Swirl the wine and admire its heady floral bouquet. Feel the single malt whiskey warm your throat. Go ahead, peel the label off that beer. Drug use is ripe with opportunity for Pavlovian learning. The sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and physiological effects of drugs can all become cues that predict the eventual high. In laboratory studies with addicts, cues that predict drugs have been shown to evoke a range of conditioned responses. Drug craving, salivation, flushed skin, a rapidly beating heart. And studies that use brain imaging techniques have shown that pictures of cues that predict drugs can cause distinct parts of the brain to light up in addicts where neutral images have no impact on the brain. So you might be thinking, well, the brains of drug users are just different to begin with, making it easier for them to succumb to um, vices like addiction. And that's a valid concern. And it's one that's difficult to address in humans, as it would require knowing in advance who is going to develop addiction. It's one reason why animal models are used to study the progression of complex human disorders such as addiction. So in my lab at Concordia, we use Pavlovian conditioning procedures with rats to understand the psychological and neural processes that could make us hardwired for vice. And I'd like to share one particularly intriguing result with you. So in a recent series of experiments, our rats received Pavlovian conditioning sessions where presentations of a visual cue were followed by access to alcohol. The, the cue was a small lever that was briefly inserted into the testing chamber where the rats were, were housed. Gradually, when the lever was presented into the chamber, the rats rushed over to where alcohol was about to be delivered and waited for it in whisker-trembling anticipation. And this is a logical response. It shows that they had learned that the lever predicted the alcohol. Remarkably, though, what we saw was that over time, the nature of this conditioned response started to change. Instead of going to the location where alcohol was about to be delivered, the rats started approaching the lever, the cue that predicted the alcohol. They started licking the lever, they started biting it, they started gnawing on it, they simply couldn't resist the cue. Now, this surprising result illustrate something fundamental about cues that predict drugs, which is that over time, these cues can become desirable and highly attractive in and of themselves. So does the same thing happen in humans? This is a difficult question to test, but 
cues that predict drugs often bridge the gap between the onset of craving and the eventual high. Imagine smokers playing with their cigarettes and their lighters. Picture someone swirling a glass of wine. Think of your own vices and their associated sensory experiences. Are any of your behaviors reinforced by these conditioned cues? I was really good at quitting smoking, so good I did it many times. <laughs> then one day, I quit cold turkey and I haven't touched a cigarette since. How might this be possible? Well, I imagine that parts of my brain began inhibiting those tobacco cravings that caused me to light up every time I walked by a loading dock. <laughs> that psychological processes that compute the costs and benefits of our actions woke up in me to remind me of my mortality. You see, even though we may be hardwired for vice, we're probably also hardwired to resist vice. That's a topic for another conversation, but it's one I'll raise my glass to today. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Jordan Peterson. I'm a psychologist and a notorious over-talker. <laughs> so I'm a psychology professor at the University of Toronto and a clinical psychologist. And uh, I've started my career actually as a political scientist, and which, which I, I stopped pursuing political science when I realized that the methods of political science were insufficient to address the issues that were at the core of the of the problems that we face as political beings. And so I turned instead to science as a way of cutting through the mess, because science does that in ways that people generally don't like, which often indicates that they're actually accurate. Um, one of the things that I've become increasingly interested over the years is in the, the vices that are associated with virtues. Today we talk a lot about sort of heroic vices, you know, sexual attraction, drunkenness, the romantic vices, um, aggression maybe, competition. Um, vice actually isn't very romantic. It's, it's, it's really ugly and it, it hurts people's lives. And by that I mean it makes them more rife with suffering than they need to be. And they're already plenty rife with suffering. So adding to that doesn't seem to be a particularly useful endeavor. And vice often clothes itself in the garb of virtue. And the virtue that I'm concerned about tonight in relationship to vice is the virtue of tolerance. Um, I'm a scientist and a psychoanalyst, and that makes me about as skeptical a person as you could ho possibly hope to meet, because a psychoanalyst never believes that people are doing what they say they're doing, and a scientist never believes that anything that anyone thinks about anything is correct. And that's usually because it isn't. And so a psychoanalytic scientist is, is extremely skeptical, and it's tolerance that deserves to have a substantial light shed on its vicious aspects. Now Jung said, Carl Jung, who I'm a great admirer of, once described an old religious idea, and that was that God ruled the world with two hands, right and left, mercy and justice. And the world couldn't survive if only mercy applied, because then no one would ever be encouraged to adopt the trappings and responsibilities of adulthood. You end up in a situation where you're forgiven for absolutely everything you do or fail to do. You're, you're, you're thrust into the Freudian nightmare of the Oedipal family, where your utter uselessness is forgiven on the grounds of compassion, and you end up living in your mother's basement until you produce fantasies huh, as a consequence of your squelched development of perhaps going out and shooting up a high school. Um, mercy, in its excess, produces pathology. Justice, in its excess, produces pathology too, because people are not are not perfect. And that means that we all fail when we attempt to do the things that we know that we should do. And so 
being held to account for our failures has to be tempered by mercy, but both principles have to apply. Justice means there's structure and rules, and the people who abide by the structure and play by the rules and move towards the top win. And mercy means we're forgiven our failures so that we can rise up and play again. But you can't have one without the other because the world falls apart if you do. And this is my problem with tolerance. Because tolerant people, first of all, let's say those who claim, proclaim the virtues of tolerance, believe that they're tolerant. But generally, that's not the case. They just don't want to accept the responsibility that playing by the rules would bring. And being useless and unable to move towards a valuable goal and failing to hold anyone else accountable as a consequence of their equivalent failures does not make you tolerant. It just makes you unable to move forward in the world in any productive manner. Now, we know that these two axes of value, tolerance, let's say, and justice are associated with two cardinal personality traits. One is agreeableness, and the other is conscientiousness. People on the radical left, politically correct people, tend to be very high in agreeableness, but they tend to be very low in conscientiousness. And that begs the question about whether or not their tolerance is a consequence of their avowed love of other people, or their hatred for the fact that any structured society requires adherence to a shared set of ordered beliefs, and the capacity for people to compete within those ordered beliefs to attain let's say, success or victory. Now, one of the things that we found recently in our research, we've been looking at conservative beliefs. Some of you may be very interested in conservative beliefs given what's happening in the United States with Donald Trump. And we found that the first factor underlying conservative belief is a factor called, we called, my female graduate students called, masculine independence. And it looks like what the, and this is the biggest factor driving political conservatism, by the way, and what it looks like is that there's a pronounced tendency, particularly among men, to erect hierarchies of value and then to compete within them so that they can reach the top. And you might think that that's a, uh, what would you call it, a counterproductive or maybe even counterhuman proclivity, but it's not, and it's partly not because women mate hypergamously, which means that they mate across and up dominance hierarchies. And what that means is that they let men compete among themselves and peel from the top of the victors. And so it's for that reason, by the way, that you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. You might think that's mathematically impossible, but it's not if every woman has one child and every man who has a child has two and every man who doesn't has zero, then you end up with twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. Part of what's happening in the United States is an increasing conflict between people of different temperaments. And we don't really understand how to mediate between that anymore. And those who are on the tolerant end of the political distribution tend to think of those who are their opposites as intolerant. But they're not necessarily intolerant. They're also justice-seeking. And justice is one of the hands, as according to Jung, that God uses to keep the world in balance. And so, I guess I'd like to conclude that by pointing out that it's a very rough situation in the political realm when either sides of a temperamental distribution make the a priori proposition that their particular temperament stands for the only virtues that are dominant and ceases to talk to the other side. And we're in that situation right now, and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And one way across that divide is for each of us, depending on our particular political stance and perhaps our inbuilt biological temperament, to note very carefully that just because we think that the way we view the world is, what would you say, uh, virtuous, that doesn't mean it isn't with its attendant vice, and it also doesn't mean that all the vice that we don't have stacks up on the other side of the political distribution. Now, if we insist upon assuming that it does, then we're going to divide 
the, the West in particular. We're going to divide the West the way that it's be dividing in the United States and the way that it's increasingly dividing in Europe. And that won't be a happy day for any of us. And so I guess I would like to conclude this by saying that vice is a very complicated thing. And the fact that it often comes clothed in the guise of virtue makes it even that much more difficult to understand. But it's necessary to note that even in your moments, even in those moments where you think that you're at your best and proclaiming virtues that you think are universal, you may have a blind spot that makes it impossible to talk to people who don't think the same way that you do. And then you might frighten yourself after that realization by coming to understand that people that you can't talk to, you can only fight with. And that's a bad outcome. So when we're congratulating ourselves on our virtues, we might attend a little bit to our vices, and that might make it easier for us to stretch out our hands and, 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 and to engage in conversation those people who share beliefs that are different than ours that we are increasingly unwilling and unable to talk to. Thank you. Hello, my name is Torquil Campbell. Um, I'm here to talk about vice as it relates to the music industry which is kind of like saying I'm here to talk about music as it relates to the music industry. <laughs> so intrinsically are the two things linked. Um, indeed, I think it's difficult to talk about vice in the context of, of the music industry and its importance in it and compare it really to any other profession. I mean, I've never had an office job, but my understanding is that it's frowned upon to show up hammered at work. Um, <laughs> with the possible exception of the advertising industry, as Terry has pointed out. Um, but even at the very bottom of the career spectrum in rock and roll, you know, the humble bar band, free alcohol is part of your contract. And as you move up this bacchanalian career ladder, one is able eventually to specify what kind of liquor you would like to receive, how much ice should come with it, whether you want fresh squeezed juice or juice in a bottle to go along with your liquor. Indeed, um, sometimes I will admit that drugs are also part of the rider. I remember uh, one time we played a show, I'm in a band called Stars, go buy my records. You remember records, buying records, anyway. Um, we were in Fribourg, Switzerland, oddly enough, beautiful art center, fully government subsidized, yay. Uh, you know, theaters gleaming on every level and all the people who worked there looked like Benetton models. And we were served a three course meal and there was beer on tap in the dressing room. And, and when I finally got the courage up to ask them if they had any weed, um, which by the way, I use because of pain that I, <laughs> sustained uh, from some shrapnel embedded in my leg during the Korean War. So if you're snickering, you know, you're snickering at a veteran and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, when I asked this, they produced a huge Tupperware container about the size of an extra large pizza box full of weed and just handed it to me. And I said, you know, I'd like to pay you for it. And they said, just do a good show in that kind of unfriendly way that Europeans talk to you. <laughs> but why? Right? Why do they give us all this booze, all this license? Why is intoxication so wrapped up in the rock and roll mythos? Well, I think back to a lunch I had just before I signed my first disastrous record deal. Um, and I had lunch with Lorena McKennett. Now, she has sold millions of records without a record deal. She is the consummate independent success story, uh, uh, furthered only, bettered only, possibly by the already mentioned and much beloved Prince. Everybody put their hands in the air for Prince right now. Put your hands in the air. That should happen at every public event for the next year. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, and she, my dad was a friend of hers, and she very kindly offered to have lunch with me and give me some advice, which is like, you know, why does anybody give advice? I mean, does anyone ever listen to advice? It's the most useless occupation in the history of the world. But she said to me, the music industry is a cross between an abattoir 
and a loan sharking operation. <laughs> and they will do anything they can to make you stay a child. They will take care of everything. They will buy your flights. They will plug in your gear. They will buy your drugs and your alcohol. And the reason that they will do all this is because drunken children are not good accountants. And they can take whatever they want from you. And over the years, you know, I've come to believe that this rather dystopian view of things did hold some truth. But I also think that our affinity for the illicit in rock and roll stems from being a part of a kind of semi-invisible demographic, that is, night people. We join taxi drivers and bartenders and doormen and sex workers and drug dealers and cops and burglars and cleaning crews. We are awake and working at a time of the day when it's harder to see what people are up to. And when the body is crashing, but the mind is racing. Vice is part of the night, yeah? So rock and roll is part of vice, and vice versa. Now, having said that, I wish I could regale you with, you know, epic tales of eating heroin-infused burritos at Gordon Lightfoot's house, or, you know, uh, bath salts-fueled orgies at Kevin Drew's apartment. Um, although I did once watch gay porn with him while eating a pizza, but there was, you know, seven other people in the room. <laughs> It was perfectly innocent. We were snowed in in Halifax. It's not important. In the little corner of the rock and roll world that I come from, pathetically called indie rock, um, you're much more likely, you know, backstage to see someone with their iPad Pro out Pinteresting a recipe for vegan pulled pork <laughs> than you are to see a group of people in horse masks fucking each other. It just doesn't. The relationship that I and many of my peers have with drugs and alcohol and illicit sex bears, I would assume, a very strong resemblance to the ones all of us in this room and everybody in society have, ranging from healthy abstinence to ruinous addiction, right? I mean, having said that too, no one in rock and roll that I know ever got credit for being an addict. It doesn't burnish your reputation anymore. That kind of glamorizing nonsense ended the day that Kurt Cobain put a gun in his mouth. And post 9-11, I think we can all agree that any trip you take could potentially turn out to be a bad one. But, you know, I feel regret about that. It's a little sad that Bacchanalia has left the building. But if the modern rock musician's rejection of the sort of stereotypical syphilitic junkie drunk is a walk away from infantilizing ourselves, if it can be the spark that makes us less vulnerable to those who may seek to take what's left of our living, then maybe this new vicelessness that seems to have taken hold right now in rock and roll is, is actually a little revolutionary. I mean, anybody who grew up in Toronto in the 80s knows that the scariest punks were the straight edge punks. Right? They were awake and therefore potentially much more dangerous to the powers that be than a bunch of teenage party animals. Imagine Morrissey with a cup of tea and a t-shirt that says the queen is dead. Imagine Ian Mackay bleeding from the hands and stone cold sober and spent after every Fugazi show. Imagine Duke Ellington for 70 years leading a band stone cold sober and conducting himself like a gentleman should. Getting wasted is cool, there's a whiff of danger to it. But if you really want to cause trouble in the music industry, give him a ring at 9 a.m. the night after the end of tour party and say, where's my money? <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. I'll be with Terry getting drunk in the bar. You see, they give us uh, drink tickets. It's part of the rider. Thank you. Man, those are good talks. I don't envy the fool who has to give the next one. So my name is Dan Riskin. I'm an evolutionary biologist and I'm going to try to round out these talks by trying to put vice in an evolutionary perspective. I think it's a good idea. Evolution provides context that helps explain why some of these vices exist, 
And it also informs the conversation about whether these things should exist, whether they're okay. I mean, if something came about naturally through the process of natural selection, should we just accept them? Is it a lost cause to fight against them? It's big questions. But before I get to those, I want to come clean about uh, my own vice. Actually, it's just one of my vices, but it's the one I'm comfortable talking about in front of a bunch of strangers. <laughs> um, so when I'm working on a, an academic task, like uh, reading a scientific paper or even an article in The Economist or I'm writing something or preparing a walrus talk, my brain does not stay focused. It goes to YouTube, it goes to Twitter, it goes to Reddit. It keeps going to places that are not gonna help me. And it's almost like my brain is working against me. So I'm trying to learn important things, I'm trying to do smart things, and my vice is clickbait and fluff, and I get very frustrated, very, very frustrated. And maybe this happens to you too, probably not. You're a very smart audience, I'm sure you guys don't have this problem. But the fact that the human brain would waste its time on something like that is endlessly frustrating because the human brain is the most powerful processing unit that has ever existed on the planet. And that is not hyperbole, let me quantify for you how amazing the human brain is, your brain. So you've heard of the human genome, right? It's all the letters of your DNA written out. Well, scientists right now are working on something called the human connectome, and that is a map of all the connections in your brain. So, you know, your brain has all these cells, they're neurons, and they connect to other neurons, and, you know, uh, the more connections they are, the more complicated it is, and you have a lot of these connections, and by, the, you know, the current estimate is that the human connectome, the number of connections, is about 10 to the 15 connections, which is, such a big number, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, that's a thousand trillion. It's one with 15 zeros after it. So I came up with a way to figure out what that number means. If you imagine a, like a little BB, like a, a little sphere that's one and a half millimeters in diameter, a little ball bearing, you can imagine how small that would be in your hand. If you had 10 to the 15 of those, you would fill the sky dome to the roof. You have that many connections in your brain. That is how powerful your brain is. And yet, with all of this computational power in my head, what does my brain do? It clicks on the link that says, this video of Prince kicking Kim Kardashian off the stage is what you need to see today. <laughs> no brain, that is not what I need to see today. Turns out my brain was right, it was a pretty good video. <laughs> so, why is my brain so stupid? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. And so, I think if you're thinking of the brain as a computing machine designed to work on big problems and do intelligent things, then yes, it is being stupid. But if you think of the brain as a organ that has evolved, that has an evolutionary history, my vice for celebrity gossip starts to maybe make a little bit more sense. The human brain wasn't designed. It was shaped by the process of natural selection over millennia, and it reacted in every generation to whatever was important at that time. So there was no end goal that we want to be doing rocket science in the 21st century. The brain was just dealing with what was going on and trying to survive that generation, as it still does today. So what was important back then? Well, you had to find food, you had to not be food, um, you had to find a mate, you had to find some other organisms to hang out with, maybe be buddies. Uh-oh, there's another group of organisms that want to fight our group. What are we going to do now? Better work on that one. War. Um, you know. <laughs> Society and relationships were really important. I mean, they, in, in a lot of ways, they still are, of course. And our brains were adapting to those important things. So if a bear walked in that door, you would all pay attention to it because your brains have been shaped by natural selection to pay attention to bears. They're dangerous animals. They're very dangerous. If a bear walked in, you really should pay attention to that. <laughs> But your brain also evolved to pay attention to relationships, relationships in your family. What are the neighbors up to? What's happening with politicians? Hey, you know, all of it, even the gossip, even Kim Kardashian. Your brain has been shaped by natural selection to pay attention to those things because they have ramifications. So what I'm trying to say is this, our brains evolved while solving different problems from the ones we're solving today, right? There were no iPhones. So the fact that our brain can't stay focused on what it's supposed to be doing on the iPhone maybe isn't such a big surprise. And maybe some of our vices come about because of this offset between what our brain evolved doing and what we're trying to do with them now. But here's the important thing to remember, and that is that understanding where something comes from doesn't justify it, right? There are lots of things that have evolved that are not good and that we shouldn't just accept. Uh, you know, it, it's funny, there's this belief that natural things are good, natural foods, natural cleanses, natural cleaners, natural remedies. If nature made it, it's okay to take it. 
It's complete horse manure. Nature made rattlesnakes, man. Nature is brutal. <laughs> and so it just because something evolved does not make it a good thing for you. I mean, nature made wisdom teeth, right? Wisdom teeth are terrible. They evolved. There's a whole evolutionary theory behind where wisdom teeth came from. So the point is, if something evolved naturally, that doesn't make it good. So even if it is an evolutionary byproduct, maybe the self-restraint of not clicking on the link is worth it. Dan, I thought you were going to say jailbait. <laughs> you did not. Because click, clickbait didn't used to be a word. <laughs> like, that's a crazy word. Just, just one sec. Torquil. Give those tickets back. <laughs> Wait, uh, check my contract, Shelly. <laughs> They're in there. Torquil, remember when Count Basie was invited on morning radio and he told the producer what time, or asked the producer what time, and the producer said 8 a.m., and he said, ah, the boys haven't even stopped throwing up by then. <laughs> you know, some things never change. I want to thank our talkers, Garvia Bailey, Sex and Drugs, Rock and Roll, and Jesus. It's quite a picture. <laughs> yeah. Rebecca Duclo, um, you know, you never pitch those stories to the walrus. <laughs> I don't know if Jonathan's still here, but you can find him at the bar. Necessary fanfare. I don't know, I'm certain we can think of something. Because, you know, porn at the walrus is they rolled over and greeted the dawn as one. <laughs> like, sort of it. So, you know, we, we can try that. Terry O'Reilly, on the radio you do have hair. <laughs> Good, right? She's excellent. Under the influence, the best title ever. Um, Nadia Chaudhry, thank you for explaining why I don't have to give up my vices. And all I can think about are drunk rats. Like, I didn't actually know that went on. Drunk rats gnawing at the little lever. It's gonna, that's gonna go around and around my head for a long time. Torquil, I'm done with you. Jordan Peterson has a new book coming out called Rules for Living, which we all look forward to. Yes. And those are our Walrus Talkers. Thank you all. There are 25 Walrus Talks across the country this year. You can come on the road with us. You can literally come on the road with us. We have a bus. Um, actually, we don't have a bus, but we, you can come. We'll be in uh, St. John's and Calgary and Winnipeg and all over, or you can stay home um, with your own wine and, and join us by live stream. We'll be right back here at the Isabel Bader on November 9th for MasterCard Foundation presents the Walrus Talks, Africa's Next Generation. So check out the walrus.ca slash events wherever you might be. We hope we've given you some food for thought and you'll visit our table in the, you'll visit our table in the lobby. What will you do there? <laughs> Excuse, sorry? <laughs> we'll subscribe at the table. There are walry there. It will save you time and money. Like really it will make, you can't be Canadian if you don't read the walrus. <laughs> this is what we say and we mean it truly. While you're at it, you can sign up for our newsletter which will tell you all about all of our Walrus events and all of the Walrus talks you can watch on Walrus TV. There's 307 of them now, thanks to these guys tonight. Thank you to everyone at Concordia, especially Alan, Sammy, Philippe, Joanne, and Leisha for your support and your help in making tonight's event possible. Our national partners, yes, Concordia, woo woo. Thank you to our national partners, Shirk, Inspire, Shaw, and Amia Aeroplan, to the stellar Walrus event team, David Leonard, Kaylin Cooper, Blair Elliott, Leanne Skippy Stepnow, Cody Galt, and Amira El Safti. Thanks to everyone at the Isabel Bader for hosting. Thank you for coming. Right before you're gonna stand up, I'm going to let our speakers go, go, go.
go, go get out first, especially because we have a broken foot. They're going to go out first and they will greet you in the lobby. There's a bar at either end. And I gave Torkel tickets for his Diet Coke. <laughs> as, Frank, as Frank Sinatra always said, I feel sorry for people who don't drink. When they wake up in the morning, that's the best they're going to feel all day. <laughs> Good night. Safe home. Don't drive. <laughs>